Every year, Western Canada's gateway generates over $21 billion in economic activity. And every year, thousands of ships transit BC's coastal waterways, bringing cargo in and taking it out. The new Oceans Protection Plan lays out a number of issues the federal government is requiring the shipping industry to meet. Tougher regulations that require working with First Nations and Indigenous communities to identify environmentally sensitive areas of cultural, social and economic importance. Stronger polluter pay principles. Identification of safe refuge sites. 24-7 emergency response and the continued modernization of the ship pilot regime. And then there is the impact of shipping on the southern resident whale population. Does the underwater noise generated by ships play a role in preventing orcas from identifying the location of the Chinook salmon that is the staple of their diet? The BC Chamber of Shipping and its members participated in the Port Metro Echo program where ships reduce speed to 11 knots in Harrow Strait in an effort to reduce ambient noise and to better understand the relationship between speed, noise and the effect on killer whales. Looming in the background is the increase of oil and LNG tanker traffic. To discuss what the shipping industry is doing to meet these concerns, issues and regulations, we invited the President of the Chamber of Shipping, Robert Lewis Manning, to join us for a conversation that matters about protecting our coastal waters. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome to Conversations That Matter. Good to be here, Stuart. And thank you for hosting us here at the Chamber of Shipping uh, offices. I wanted to come down here because what's happening on our coastal waterways is we're seeing increased traffic, increased pressure, increased concern. Uh, the federal government, the provincial government, local governments, everybody's paying attention to what's happening on the water. Can you give us just a little report card of where are we at as far as activity is concerned and what are we doing to make sure that we address a number of the issues and we can start to get into those? Well, I think it's an exciting time. It, it's not a bad thing to have attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a sector, I think uh, we're in a, a great place where um, we can both leverage things that are going really well and also be a little bit respective of the fact that there are things that we need to improve. So um, as an industry, we've just come out of three years of commercial hardship. There's been a reorganization of a lot of shipping companies globally and ones that trade in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, so commercially, we're on a, a positive trend and, and there's some light at the end of a very difficult uh, recession. Um, and that's sort of corresponding with an increased uh, awareness by uh, First Nation and coastal communities about what's important to them as mm -hmm. far as protecting their coast. Uh, align that with uh, both a federal and provincial government that have um, both a, a lot of interest in keeping our coasts safe um, and increasing trade um, and it, it's a good mixture. So we're, we're in an interesting time period where, where I think the stars are aligning to, to do all of the right things for the right reason. Mm -hmm. When we take a look at large vessel movement in the coastal waterways, how many movements a year are we talking about right now? Well, in BC, it's roughly 12,000 movements, mm -hmm. and, and that's been fairly steady over the last five years. Um, I guess what has changed, and you can see on the horizon will change, is generally um, we expect similar type of volume, but the ships are likely going to increase in size, whether they're cargo ships, cruise ships, you name it. Mm -hmm. Of those 12,000 plus ship movements, how many incidents are there? Because I don't hear about very many incidents at all. Actually, in the last year, I'm not sure that I heard of any. Well, it, it's extremely low. Um, however, it only takes really one incident to reveal where there are weaknesses in the safety framework. So um, last year, we did, we did have a tug and barge ground mm -hmm. um, in Bella Bella in the, in, the, in the traditional territories of the Helsinki Nation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it really has caused um, both a lot of attention both, but also a real opportunity to look at w what isn't working as well as it could work. Was that a single tug? or It was a single tug towing an empty barge. Okay. And, it and, was. Uh, but as far as large vessel movement, 
is concerned. Have we had any incidents? No, it's it's been a, a, a very tight safety framework and, and all the statistics point towards um, increasing success with that safety framework. How is it that we managed to do that? Because when you start to think about 12,000 movements in a 365 day year, that's a lot of traffic every day. How do we ensure that there that it's happening as safely as it is. Well, you certainly need a tight regulatory regime, and that includes many departments of the federal government. Um, but it goes right down to the, the level of an individual operator in understanding what their safety management system is. So we're seeing um, increased focus on all of those safety mechanisms, whether they're at an individual company level, whether they're at a terminal facility for mm -hmm. loading and unloading cargo, and also the federal government, which is certainly putting a lot of resources into both examining where the weaknesses are and how to fix them. And, and a lot of that will unfold under the federal government's Ocean Protection Plan over the coming five years. Okay, so how does that work? If, if so many of the vessels that are entering into our waterway are flying under a foreign flag, how do we ensure that they're going to be meeting the standard of operating uh, principles and safety pr protocols that exist here? And then what happens if something goes wrong? How do we ensure that they're going to be held responsible for that? Well, I think the first part is understanding what the risk is. And that is a, a role both of ports, terminals, and the federal government to, to do that risk analysis in advance of a vessel or a type of vessel or a commodity trade actually arriving on our coast. Mm -hmm. so, so you can imagine that the risk isn't the same for all types of vessels. Um, and it could be different for different commodity types, uh, the potential for impact. Um, but that starts early. That, that understands the traffic patterns, how they operate, um, when they operate, and under what conditions they operate. So that type of, of forward-thinking risk assessment um, is already happening, and I expect it to increase under the Oceans Protection Plan. Um, when those vessels arrive onto our coast, it's about ensuring that there is a regulatory regime that continues to analyze that risk as a vessel approaches the coast. Um, and that scrutiny in the regulatory regime increases as it gets closer. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, of course, there is a BC Coast pilot that boards that vessel that is the expert in maneuvering ships in BC's waters. Um, so when they're on the bridge, do they have command of that ship then? They, they don't have command of that ship, but they do have control of that vessel, um, which, which means they, the only person that would override them is the captain of the vessel, mm -hmm. and only under the most dire of situations that uh, the captain may think that uh, The that safety of the ship be might be on. at risk. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. D does that ever happen? And certainly there's, there's not a lot of instances of that happening. There's a high degree of trust and accountability in the pilots that serve um, this coast. Um, and that relationship continues to improve um, because we're always looking at that framework. And, and when I say we, both the industry, uh, but also the federal government. So let's say something does happen. And, and you know everybody is concerned right now when we see an increase in oil tanker traffic uh, associated with the Kinder Morgan uh, expansion. Uh, let's say something happens and it's under uh, the command of the pilot and the ship is tethered, uh, who ultimately is responsible and, and how do we make them accountable for that? Ultimately the, the captain of that vessel is responsible for his or her vessel. So the liability would go to the shipping company? It, absolutely. Uh -huh. And there is a, uh, there is a framework uh, of that liability, but I guess in the immediate sense, if, a, if an incident happens, let's say a, a vessel loses its power or um, that tethered vessel, mm -hmm. um, the pilot is going to be the expert in maneuvering that vessel uh, without power but with the aid of those tugs that are tethering it. So mm -hmm. um, it's like having three other engines um, that for are that going vessel. to continue to guide that vessel. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and maybe not guide it to its original destination. Maybe that's putting it somewhere safely at anchor until such time as the situation can be fully analyzed. Because the biggest challenge, I, as I understand it, would be a loss of power when they're in a narrow waterway. Ab absolutely. And of course, managing that vessel with those support tugs is part of analyzing the risk of that vessel. So it can be 
safely dealt with if there is an incident. One of the things that I think about when we had the oil spill a couple of years ago out in English Bay, this question came up, uh, well, who's going to pay for it? And I understand that there is an insurance that all ships must carry that then uh, picks up the cost of responding to that uh, incident. You are absolutely correct. Okay. And, and in fact, that I, was, I wasn't sure about that because you, you hear yeah. people saying, okay, well, why do we have to be on the hook for cleaning this up? And that liability regime has actually been changed in Canada to put even more onus on the ship owner. Um, so the federal government did that quite early in its mandate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's really changed and what was really important uh, to communities was the ability to access that liability funding quickly to deal with a very local challenge. So um, the Ship Oil Pollution Fund has been adjusted in order to make that happen faster. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real key when you're dealing with a situation. So when we see the increase in oil tanker traffic and then we also take a look at the Oceans Protection Plan, what is going to be enhanced as far as our ability to respond to incidents that would put a pollutant into the water? Well, there's a whole host. There's actually 54 programs in the Oceans Protection Plan, and a number of them are focused in towards that level, that part of the risk. Um, situational awareness and information flow is a key part of that, so we'll see an increase in that so that um, hopefully the reaction time is faster. Um, we're going to see the Coast Guard um, develop relationships with, with First Nations and coastal communities so there can actually be a local response faster. As you can imagine, some of the incidents that have happened on this coast haven't happened in a populated area. No, they're happening in remote areas. Like the areas. Port of Vancouver, they're happening in more remote areas. So yeah. it makes complete sense to have a local capability that can be the first responder. So that would put resources and training into, into those uh, in, areas. In, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a positive, a very positive step. All the details of that are aren't exactly known yet, but it's going to unfold over the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. and, and then you talk about really concrete resources like the government's commitment to having uh, um, response vessels in the high traffic areas, such as the Salish Sea, mm -hmm. um, a, as a very positive movement um, towards um, a, a faster response. $150 million coming to uh, the Western Marine Response Corporation specifically for uh, areas in uh, south coast of BC and then uh, a billion and a half dollars of federal government programming focused on reducing risk. So this goes beyond any concerns that are associated with the Kinder Morgan expansion. It's really in uh, addressing issues throughout the entire coastal region. Absolutely yeah. and, and focusing some of those resources to places where there is higher risk. Huh. So I was also reading that uh, there were, there's going to be an increase in navigational aids, that there's going to be uh, is a hydrosonic uh, um, mapping of uh, a variety of uh, waterways that I guess we don't have accurate information on, which caught me by surprise a little bit. I, I thought we had very detailed maps at well, this we, point. We do for some places, yeah. but the, I, the increase in vessel size also demands that you understand the bottom topography as much as you understand the coastal topography. So um, just last week the, the Minister of Transportation announced another 20 million dollars for um, hydrographic charting mm -hmm. and, and you can imagine if you're going to if a larger container ship or a larger cruise ship is going to call in the port of Vancouver understanding how the water flows not just on the surface but yeah. below the surface is critical to both understanding the risk but also mitigating that risk with right policies, procedures, and actual, the use of tugs. Yeah. So that brings us to the resident killer whale population here on the south coast, uh, which we are seeing is under duress. Fewer than 80 uh, magnificent creatures that are still uh, with us. Um, and a number of people point to you know some of the causes being a decrease in the salmon population but also vessel noise and I know that you were at a conference last week addressing this very issue what can we do to reduce vessel noise now and then as we move forward well I, I think there's no doubt that this iconic species is endangered it's listed as endangered under the Species at Risk Act, which means it has legal protection. Mm -hmm. um, so that in itself is the reason to get involved if you needed a reason. Yeah. Um, 
we have enough information now to know that the noise that vessels transmit through the water makes it more difficult for marine mammals to locate their prey. Um, in this case, in this population of uh, southern resident killer whales is largely Chinook salmon. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we know we have a role to play in helping the recovery of this, uh, uh, of this whale. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Uh, well, first of all, we, we wanted to understand what type of noise we were making. So we have over the course of two years been listening to our vessels um, in the Salish Sea to understand what type of vessels make what type of noise. And we've learned an incredible amount. We know that some vessels make more noise than others. What kinds of vessels make more noise? Um, well, we know that container ships at speed make more noise than a, a bulker not at speed. Mm -hmm. um, so that type of understanding helps us to think about what we can do in the future um, to reduce that noise. Well, and I know that they've uh, basically reduced the speed limit on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Are we, going to, are we doing the same thing here? And is that going to be enough? Two different, two different so, reasons. Yeah, different reasons, I understand. But So, so, so we just finished a two-month um, industry-led trial um, where we reduced the speed in Harrow Strait down to 11 knots. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to measure whether that reduction in speed, in fact, reduces the overall ambient noise uh, in the Harrow Strait itself. Do you have findings Which is a key that? area for foraging for yeah. the sun resident killer whale. Well, yeah. we've only got an inkling. We've got some indications that point towards the fact that the overall noise has been reduced, but it's going to be about two months until mm -hmm. um, the ECHO program, which is run out of the Port of Vancouver, ha has analyzed the data. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we're fairly optimistic at this point. Um, so what, what the interesting part of that trial is, um, for the most part, we didn't see the southern resident killer whale this summer um, when we had expected to see it in Harrow Strait. Um, it was largely outside of the Salish Sea for most of the summer. Oh. So what we learned also is that we're going to need adaptive uh, framework in order to reduce noise. So we're right in the middle of a very intensive analysis of eight different mitigation measures that are under consideration for commercial shipping. Um, to see what is the best combination of those measures mm -hmm. that, that will help this species. And, and I expect the federal government will probably uh, make announcements in the new year about which direction um, it intends to take. Is there an impact from an economic perspective to shipping companies to reduce that speed? Um, because yeah. I can't help but think that there's going to be people who are going to go, well, hang on a second, you're affecting my delivery dates. Absolutely, and, and you can imagine uh, if, if you have shoreside labor waiting to load or unload a vessel, that there is the potential for further inefficiencies. But that's part of our analysis and research is to, mm -hmm. to understand our supply chain well enough that, that we hope that we can modify it in the future in order to support greater efficiencies and also support the recovery of the whales. So um, it's just as important as understanding the noise in the water is understanding how we can mitigate the effects of potential adjustments in the future. So is the primary source of that noise like the cavitation of the uh, propeller as it you know, moves the ship forward or are there other elements at work there? It, clearly the, the propulsion and the actual noise created by the propeller is the loudest noise source. Um, but we do see differences in vessels um, based on their age as well. So, mm -hmm. so we know that newer vessels are probably built to higher standards and, and consequently have reduced noise signature as well. So um, that's a positive thing because we know there's, there's change in construction standards that are happening globally for mm -hmm. other reasons. For example, reducing greenhouse gases um, and other emissions um, that could have a positive impact on our noise profile as well. What about uh, additional or uh, supplementary drive uh, systems that might be operational in tighter waterways like this, is that a possibility? Technology absolutely is going to be an option in the future mm -hmm. and in fact the Port of Vancouver already offers a, a financial incentive for vessels that use certain technologies or have a, a quiet designation um, from a, a class society that certifies vessels. So um, we have seen a bit of pickup for those incentives mm -hmm. and we know some companies that operate regularly into the Port of Vancouver are taking advantage of that now by installing those technologies. Mm -hmm. So there is some hope with technological uh, efficiencies. It'll probably take some time though. 
I'm asking this question, and I realize as I ask it, I'm not doing so to put you on the spot, but I'm just thinking about the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. And do, do your activities uh, wind up interacting with that? Are you able to support what they're doing if we're all you know, looking at the resident uh, killer whale population and saying the health of the entire region matters to all of us? Well, I, I think this is where the Oceans Protection Plan, plan um, crosses over to marine safety and also species at risk. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, it is the complete health of the Salish Sea that matters. And the cumulative impact of human use needs to be measured, mitigated, and managed in the future. So I'm hoping that the Ocean Protection Plan will bring that level of integration such that we do see the net benefit um, as we also increase trade. So yeah. I, th I think it's a positive change in mentality and approach. Which the environmentalist side of me says, yay, let, let's do that. But they also, I live in an economy that is so dependent upon trade, are we putting into place measures that uh, reduce our competitiveness? Or are we finding that uh, up and down the west coast of uh, North America, uh, th these are happening in other jur jurisdictions, namely the United States, um, because you know, we do have to remain competitive and we do have other ports that say, well, you can bring that business here. Well, <laughs> absolutely we have to be concerned about the competitiveness of our gateways. Um, and you can imagine the companies that I represent um, have a keen interest in this. So mm -hmm. um, it's about being able to do it smartly. And, and I think uh, certainly in the lower mainland here in Vancouver, um, we are being very progressive in trying to do both smartly. And, and I think we'll see a pickup uh, both from shippers, the people that own the cargo, uh, consumers that are buying that cargo, and the companies that move those cargos to, to respecting both. And um, I think there's a bit of momentum, which is very positive, and I think it's good for the Lower Mainland. Well, I think it's good for the Lower Mainland, the province, and of course Canada as a whole. And I'm happy to see that the, you know, the shipping industry has taken this on with uh, as, as much um, uh, willingness to embrace the need to change as you are because we do need to protect this environment. Thank you very much for doing this. Thanks very much, Stuart.